Charles Dickens is the most important single figure in the history of English fiction. And because his achievement is so enormous, we will need to divide his career in two. In this lecture, we'll consider his earliest works, following his progress from 1833 to 1846. In a later lecture, we'll consider the great achievements of his mature years. And that's a period that includes such works as Dombey and Son, which appeared in serial form from 1847 to 1848, David Copperfield, 1849 to 1850, Bleak House, 1852 to 1853, and Great Expectations, 1860 to 1861. Dickens' life story is at least as remarkable as the stories contained in his novels, so let's start there. He was born in 1812 and died in 1870. His origins were middle class, like those of many of the writers we have studied, but he's also unusual in that he experienced poverty firsthand when his father was arrested and imprisoned for debt. Debtors' prisons usually strike us as very strange institutions. How can you earn money and obtain your release if you're locked up? But they were well established in England during Dickens' lifetime. One of his later novels, Little Dorrit, is set in a debtor's prison. While his father was imprisoned, the young Dickens, and he, we think he was about 10 years old at this time, worked in a factory pasting labels on bottles of boot blacking, shoe polish. He got to be very, very good at this task and was eventually placed in a front window where passersby could see him at work. Before his father's arrest, Dickens had been a good student who loved school and enjoyed reading. He had begun to dream of achieving some sort of distinction in life, and those dreams were shattered as he was sent off to work in the factory. Years later, Dickens admitted that this experience left him feeling utterly neglected and hopeless. And here's a passage from uh, work in which he describes this experience. It is wonderful to me, he says, how I could have been so easily cast away at such an age. It is wonderful to me that even after my descent into the poor little drudge I had been since we came to London, no one had compassion enough on me, a child of singular abilities, quick, eager, delicate, and soon hurt, bodily or mentally, to suggest that something might have been spared, as certainly it might have been, to place me at any common school. Our friends, I take it, were tired out. No one made any sign. My father and mother were quite satisfied. They could hardly have been more so if I had been 20 years of age, distinguished at a grammar school, and going to Cambridge. Now, as this passage shows, Dickens developed deeply ambivalent feelings toward his parents, and, and really toward parenthood itself, although that didn't keep him from having ten children of his own. Instead of providing for him, his parents were relying upon him. In particular, the young Dickens wondered why his sister was allowed to continue her music lessons while he was sent out to work. He also found it difficult to understand why his father's release from prison, after a period of about five months or so, did not lead to an immediate change in his own situation. Why couldn't he go back to school? Why did his mother insist on his continuing to work in the blacking factory? Dickens struggles with such questions in a remarkable text known to scholars as the autobiographical fragment, and this text is the source of the passage that I read to you a moment ago. Dickens began working on it in the middle of the 1840s, but never found a way to finish it. It was apparently too painful. And the text would not appear in print until after his death, when it was published by his friend and biographer, John Forster. It was not until that point that Dickens' secret was finally revealed to the public. Indeed, Forster may have been the only person in whom he ever confided this secret. Certainly his children had no idea of what he had endured as a boy. As we consider a second passage from the fragment, please note the repetition of words like shame and misery, grief and humiliation. And please note, too, the absence of words like anger, and resentment. Even as an adult, secure in just about every possible way, 
Dickens finds it difficult to acknowledge such feelings. No words, he writes, no words can express the secret agony of my soul as I felt my early hopes of growing up to be a learned and distinguished man crushed in my breast. The deep remembrance of the sense I had of being utterly neglected and hopeless, of the shame I felt in my position, of the misery it was to my young heart to believe that day by day what I had learned and thought and delighted in and raised my fancy and my emulation up by was passing away from me, never to be brought back any more. It cannot be written. My whole nature was so penetrated with the grief and humiliation of such considerations that even now, famous and caressed and happy, I often forget in my dreams that I have a dear wife and children, even that I am a man, and wander desolately back to that time in my life. Scholars and biographers agree that Dickens' experience of neglect and poverty was formative, serving as the basis for much of his later fiction. So if you've ever wondered why Dickens' novels are so full of orphans and poor children, now you know. He had been one himself. He knew what it was like to be alone and hungry, and he wanted his readers to know it too. Dickens never did return to school, and I think this would always be a kind of sore point with him. He spent his teens working as a clerk in a law office, eventually moving on to a job as a reporter. Now, in those days, long before audio and videotape, much of the reporter's job consisted simply of transcribing as accurately as, accurately as possible the words of various officials. So someone's making a speech or they're having a debate in Parliament and you have to take down those words exactly. A special system of shorthand was developed for this purpose, and Dickens became a master of it. Indeed, he was said to have been faster and more accurate in his transcriptions than any other reporter in London. While still working as a reporter, Dickens began to produce urban sketches and stories for several publications. He published these sketches under the name Boz, from time to time, he used other pseudonyms as well, and he enjoyed a fair amount of success with them. The first sketch appeared in 1833, when he was only 21 years old, and many of the sketches were collected and published in book form in 1835. In a typical sketch, Dickens might write about cab drivers or list the telltale signs of a doomed shop, you know, the kind of place that always seems to be uh, right on the edge of going out of business. And as I recall, one of the tip-offs, according to Dickens, is a fresh cone of paint on the outside of the shop. A tradesman never spits up, spits up his place unless he thinks it'll help to boost sales. Now, Dickens was one of the first major writers for whom urbanization was an established fact. By the mid-1830s, when he published that first book, the population of London was already well over 1.5 million people. The city had effectively doubled in size since the middle of the 18th century. Though still a very young man, he knew the city intimately, a result in part of his experience in the blacking factory. He had walked to and from the job on his own, and though he hated the work, he seems to have loved the commute, paying close attention to the people and places he saw along the way. Even the experience of visiting his father in the prison would prove helpful to him later on. When I went into the Marshalsea of a night, he wrote in the autobiographical fragment, I was always delighted to hear from my mother what she knew about the histories of the different debtors. Their different peculiarities of dress, of face, of gait, of manner were written indelibly upon my memory. The city and his residence would become Dickens' most enduring source of inf inspiration, as well as his most important subject. To understand his view of the city, let's turn our attention to a passage from one of his early sketches called Gin Shops, first published in 1835. Dickens begins by telling us that his aim is to sketch the bar of a large gin shop and its ordinary customers, but then explains that he cannot get us to our destination without passing through a filthy and miserable neighborhood called the Rookery. Now, as we make our way through these sentences, please notice that they become almost as crowded and chaotic as the slums themselves. The filthy and miserable appearance of this part of London, he writes, can hardly be imagined by those, and there are many such who have not witnessed it. <laughs> 
wretched houses with broken windows patched with rags and paper. Every room led out to a different family, and in many instances, to two or even three. Fruit and sweet stuff manufacturers in the cellars, barbers and red herring vendors in the front parlors, and cobblers in the back. A bird fancier in the first floor, three families on the second, starvation in the attics, Irishman in the passage. A musician in the front kitchen, and a charwoman and five hungry children in the back one. Filth everywhere, a gutter before the houses and a drain behind. Clothes drying and slops emptying from the windows. Girls of 14 or 15 with matted hair walking about barefooted and in white greatcoats, almost their only covering. Boys of all ages in coats of all sizes and no coats at all. Men and women in every variety of scanty and dirty apparel, lounging, scolding, drinking, smoking, squabbling, fighting, and swearing. As we read this passage, it's almost as if we're walking alongside Dickens, taking in the sights and smells of the wretched houses. Then, without warning, he points us in a new direction. You turn the corner, he says. What a change. All is light and brilliancy. The hum of many voices issues from that splendid gin shop which forms the commencement of the two streets opposite, and the gay building with the fantastically ornamented parapet the illuminated clock, the plate glass windows surrounded by stucco rosettes, and its profusion of gas lights in richly gilt burners is perfectly dazzling when contrasted with the darkness and dirt we have just left. The interior is even gayer than the exterior. A bar of French polished mahogany, elegantly carved, extends the whole width of the place, and there are two side aisles of great casks, painted green and gold, enclosed within a light brass rail and bearing such inscriptions as Old Tom, 549, Young Tom, 360, Samson, 1421. Beyond the bar is a lofty and spacious saloon, full of the same enticing vessels, with a gallery running round it, equally well furnished. At first, we may be surprised by Dickens' juxtaposition of the wretched rookery with the splendid interior of the gin shop. Before long, we realize that the two places are closely connected. With the slums providing customers for the gin shop and gin, or alcoholism, keeping those customers in poverty. What Dickens is saying here, what he wants us to see and to feel, is that although a city like London appears to divide or separate its residents, if you choose, you don't ever have to go through the rookery. That separation is only an illusion. In reality, poverty and splendor are connected, especially in a place like London. And for Dickens, it's the business of the writer to reveal those connections to us. Dickens' view of London is thus very different from the ones we've encountered before. In Tom Jones, Fielding takes his hero to London, but never really attempts to represent the city as a whole. The same thing is true in Evelina. Bernie provides wonderfully detailed descriptions of famous places, the Opera House, the Vauxhall Gardens, but she never ranges as widely as Dickens. Dickens learned a great deal from writing his London sketches, discovering and developing many of his most important themes. But he did not master the arts of extending a narrative or developing a character, and those deficiencies are obvious in many of his first attempts at longer works of fiction. In these works, he experimented with many styles and formats, sometimes verging on the novelistic, sometimes diverging from it. Through this early period, Dickens sometimes seems unsure of himself, as if he doesn't know what kind of writer he wants to be. Should he continue on as a journalist? Maybe even edit a newspaper. He tried it for a brief period. Should he attempt to establish himself as a really serious writer, a full-fledged novelist? Or should he consider writing for the stage? He tried that too. Complicating his problems, as recent critics have shown, is the need to rec reckon with the legacy of Sir Walter Scott. Scott died in 1832 just a few years before Dickens began to appear in print, and he continued to cast a long shadow over the rest of the literary world. 
Scott's kind of historical fiction still enjoyed great prestige, and his habit of publishing his novels in three separate volumes still exerted enormous influence over both readers and reviewers. This particular form of publication was also encouraged by the owners of circulating libraries, institutions a bit like modern video stores. When a customer was finished with the first volume of a novel by Scott or some other writer, she could return it to the library and check out the second volume. Thus, three customers could be renting and reading the same novel at the same time. It is important to note that most Victorian readers were dependent on circulating libraries, since the cost of books was prohibitively expensive. Here again, the analogy to the video store is instructive. If you're only going to watch a movie once or twice, why spend 30 or $40 for your own copy? Why not rent or borrow it from a store or a library? We'll hear more about the circulating libraries when we get to the lecture on Thomas Hardy. For now, a couple of things are worth noting. First, publication in three volumes would remain the dominant form through much of the 19th century. Second, Dickens operated largely outside this system, publishing his novels in monthly and weekly installments rather than as triple-deckers. His use of serial publication gave him considerable freedom, yet it also made his works somewhat difficult to classify. And this is a very important point. Early works like The Pickwick Papers, Oliver Twist, or Nicholas Nickleby just didn't look much like novels. Each monthly installment of a work like Pickwick or Nickleby included three or four chapters worth of text, plus two illustrations, and these were placed at the very front of the installment, not mixed in with the text, as they might be in a modern paperback edition. Two illustrations and a whole bunch of advertisements, and I mean a whole bunch of them. The advertisements were mostly taken out by other publishers, and a wide variety of titles were listed. Mixed in with those ads, however, were ads for wigs, artificial limbs, headache powders, and quite often a big spread, sometimes two or three pages, for Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce. Now, at my school, we're lucky enough to have a complete set of the original monthly numbers for Pickwick, as well as several other Dickens novels. And students are always surprised by the look and feel of these things. Even today, they just don't conform to our preconceptions of what a novel should be. A novel by Dickens is supposed to have a very pretty painting on the front, it's supposed to be, you know, all Dickens from start to finish. You certainly wouldn't imagine finding advertisements for Worcestershire sauce or other condiments kind of leafed in the middle there. Now, occasionally, someone will attempt to revive some form of serial publication. Armistead Maupin's Tales of the City novels were originally published serially, and Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities first appeared in biweekly installments for Rolling Stone magazine. Even now, as we tape these lectures, both the New York Times magazine and the online journal Slate are experimenting with serial stories. Nevertheless, it doesn't really surprise me to learn that at the time of their first appearance in print, Dickens' early works were usually described not as novels, but rather as miscellanies or magazines. To flesh out our understanding of this situation, let's consider the Pickwick Papers, Dickens' first attempt at a longer, more substantial work of fiction. It appeared in monthly installments through 1836 and into 1837. Dickens was originally hired to work on Pickwick as a kind of freelancer. He was 24 years old. A publisher had contracted with a popular illustrator to create a work about hapless urban sportsmen, kind of like Victorian versions of Elmer Fudd. And this publisher asked Dickens, then enjoying some success with his sketches, to supply the text. Now, the result is one of the weirdest episodes in literary history, for shortly after the first installment appeared, I think this is right. The illustrator committed suicide. I mean, I know that he committed suicide. I'm just not sure that it was after the first installment or a somewhat later one. And some people say that he took his own life because of his inability to get along with Dickens. Now, there's no evidence in support of that claim, by the way, but it's a legend that persists nevertheless. Instead of scrapping the project, the publisher decided to keep it going. A new illustrator was hired, and before long, the work became a popular sensation. Dickens' name was made, and his enduring bond with the English reading public was forged. At no point in the course of these events was Dickens expected or asked to produce anything like a novel. 
Pickwick was always supposed to be a series of episodes, not an extended narrative. Now, as Dickens tried to capitalize on the success of Pickwick, he sometimes worked to produce something more like a novel. His second work, Oliver Twist, actually began as a political satire, focused on the new poor law of 1834. This law, only recently passed, forced those seeking relief from, a, from poverty to enter a workhouse, where they might be asked to perform menial labor and be separated from other members of their family. Oliver Twist is living in a workhouse when he makes his famous request for more gruel. Before long, Dickens decided to see if he couldn't transform Oliver Twist into a novel. He added a love story and deepened the mystery surrounding Oliver's birth. Much of his motivation, it should be noted, was financial. He had contracted with a publisher to write a novel, realized that he was overextended, and was trying to get the publisher to accept Oliver Twist in lieu of the promised and as yet unwritten book. He took another step in the direction of the novel with Nicholas Nickleby, which he began before he was even finished with Oliver Twist. I told you that he was overextended. This story, Nickleby, appeared in monthly installments from the spring of 1838 to the fall of 1839. It follows the adventures of a young man culminating in his marriage to his sweetheart, but it lacks the coherent plot of a work such as Tom Jones or Waverley. That's really no surprise, since, like Pickwick, Dickens' early works were largely improvised. He would begin with ideas for a few characters and situations, and perhaps with some sense of the ending. But that was all. The rest he would make up on the fly. There are a good many examples of this kind of improvisation in Nickleby. In my favorite, Nicholas happens to meet the manager of a theatrical troupe, Mr. Vincent Crummels. He always uses his full name, and so does the narrator, who asks him about his plans for the future. And as we make our way through this passage, we might just remember some of Dickens' own uncertainties about his own future. So Mr. Crummels starts, and he says to Nicholas, does any profession occur to you which a young man of your figure and address could take up easily and see the world to advantage in? No, said Nicholas, shaking his head. Why then, I'll tell you one, said Mr. Crummles, throwing his pipe into the fire and raising his voice. The stage! The stage! cried Nicholas in a voice almost as loud. The theatrical profession, said Mr. Vincent Crummles. I am in the theatrical profession myself. My wife is in the theatrical profession. My children are in the theatrical profession. I had a dog that lived and died in it from a puppy, and my chase pony goes on stage in Tim or the Tartar. I don't know anything about it, rejoined Nicholas, whose breath had been almost taken away by this sudden proposal. I never acted a part in my life except at school. Now, at this point, we really do need to remember one other important biographical tidbit, and that is that Dickens had briefly considered the possibility of going on the stage himself. He had an audition at Covent Garden Theatre, a pretty big break, uh, sometime around 1833, but had to miss it because of, of illness. So anyway, let's go back to Crummel's. This is how he tries to persuade Nicholas. He says, there's genteel comedy in your walk and manner, juvenile tragedy in your eye, and touch-and-go farce in your laugh, said Mr. Vincent Crummel's. You'll do as well as if you had thought of nothing else but the lamps from your birth downwards. Nicholas is interested in the possibility of joining the troupe, so he agrees to sign on, eventually writing scripts, actually ripping them off from French sources, and appearing on stage. He sticks with the actors for a while, but before long decides that he has to move on, and so he just does. And that's how Dickens mostly likes to work in these early books. He finds an interesting subject, sticks with it for a while, and then heads off in another direction. The result can be terrific. The scenes with the actors are probably the very best thing in Nickleby, and they're some of my favorite passages in all of Dickens. But they aren't exactly novelistic. Over the next few years, Dickens would continue to experiment, producing some of the most varied and unusual works of his career. In the old curiosity shop, he drew much of his inspiration from fairy tales. Now, this was a strange move, especially for a writer who seemed eager to establish himself as a novelist, but Dickens made it eagerly. For this work, he created settings and characters that can only be described as grotesque. Dickens signals his departure from the conventions of the novel in the opening of this work. 
as his narrator recalls the image of little Nell, a girl he's encountered in a visit to the curiosity shop. As we move through this passage, you might notice the references to otherworldly figures, like angels and fairies, and to non-novelistic forms, like allegory. I sat down in my easy chair, the narrator says, and falling back upon its ample cushions, pictured to myself the child in her bed, alone, unwatched, uncared for, save by angels, yet sleeping peacefully, so very young, so spiritual, so slight and fairy like a creature passing the long dull nights in such an uncongenial place, I could not dismiss it from my thoughts. I am not sure that I should have been so thoroughly possessed by this one subject, but for the heaps of fantastic things I had seen huddled together in the curiosity dealer's warehouse. These, crowding upon my mind, in conjunction with the child and gathering round her, as it were, brought her condition palpably before me. She seemed to exist in a kind of allegory, and having these shapes about her claimed my interest so strongly that, as I have already remarked, I could not dismiss her from my recollection, do what I would. Thus, Dickens tells us that he's not attempting any simple sort of realism here. Instead, he's taking us into a dream or fantasy world. Now, that world might be viewed as an alternate reality, connected in various ways to the world that we ordinarily describe as real. But in any case, it's not the sort of place described by writers like Fielding or Bernie or Scott. The old curiosity shop was very popular, with sales of its monthly installments reaching 100,000 copies. But it was also hard to classify and critical response to it was deeply divided. Before moving on, we should note that Dickens' popularity did not remain constant. Like any great popular artist, he had his hits and his misses. What's more, like Charlie Chaplin or Woody Allen in the 20th century, he sometimes chafed against his original reputation as a comedian, as if eager to break out and do more serious work. In Barnaby Rudge, his fifth major work, Dickens changed directions again, this time producing something unmistakably novelistic. Barnaby Rudge was published in 1841. A historical novel modeled on the works of Scott, it dramatizes the Gordon riots of 1780. And I have to say, even as a lover of Dickens, that the Gordon riots are not the most promising subject for a historical novel. Um, they didn't last very long. The leader of the riots was a sort of disreputable figure, and the whole point of the riots was to make sure that Catholics weren't allowed to vote. But this is the subject that Dickens chose. He hoped that Barnaby Rudge would secure his reputation as a serious writer, but it actually had a different effect, alienating both readers and critics. After taking two years off and making the first of his, fir of his two different tours of the United States, Dickens returned to contemporary subjects in Martin Chuzzlewit, once again focusing on the adventures of a young hero. Dickens tried to give Chuzzlewit the coherence lacking in his earlier works, paying greater attention to character development and centering the story on the larger theme of selfishness. We know this because he said so in the preface to the first one-volume edition of the work, published in 1844. I have endeavored in the process of this tale, he writes there, to resist the temptation of the current monthly number and to keep a steadier eye upon the general purpose and design. With this object in view, I have put a strong constraint upon myself from time to time in many places, and I hope my story is the better for it now. The moralizing language of this passage is interesting, I think. Here Dickens speaks of resisting temptation and of constraining himself. Like a good Victorian gentleman, and we are about six or seven years into Victoria's reign at this point, he prides himself on his self-mastery and self-control. The passage also suggests that Martin Chuzzlewit, or the novel form rather, at least as developed by writers like Fielding and Scott, may not in the end have been the best medium for the young Dickens. The novel form may not have been the best medium for him. We've heard about Fielding's careful construction of the plot of Tom Jones, six books in the 
country, six on the road, six in the city, and it's hard to imagine the author of Nickleby or Chuzzlewit sticking to that sort of plan. Now, though not a failure on the order of Barnaby Rudge, Chuzzlewit was nevertheless unsuccessful. Sales of the opening installment were low, and reviews were mixed. It's no exaggeration to say, then, that by the time Martin Chuzzlewit completed its run in the summer of 1844, Dickens had reached a turning point, a fork in the road. His initial attempts at novel writing had been disappointing, and as one London paper reported, it was becoming the rage to decry him. Dickens' disappointment was deepened by the fact that he knew and felt himself to be making progress, to be growing and developing as a writer. While writing Chuzzlewit, Dickens had begun to develop his own understanding of the novel form in which a narrative could be both disciplined and expansive, coherent and freewheeling. His new understanding would pay off in his later works, allowing him to create many of the most important novels in the English tradition. Yet if only because Dickens loved a good cliffhanger, I think it's best for us to leave him for a while, turning our attention to writers often viewed as his rivals. After separate lectures on Thackeray and the Brontes, we'll return to Dickens himself, exploring his later works and assessing his larger achievements.